Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those who are joining us today for the fourth edition of Spaceport Sarabhai's Space Law and Policy Dialogue. I am Dr. Shreya Sansra, Curator for Debates and Dialogues at Spaceport Sarabhai, India's first dedicated space think tank. The main objectives of Spaceport Sarabhai are to give India an international voice, grow the body of knowledge that informs critical areas of space policy, build public perspectives through writings, events, and conversations, provide policy guidance to the government, and to transform India into a developed space economy by 2030. The goal of our bilateral space law and policy dialogues is to look at contemporary space activities through a space law and policy lens, as well as to strengthen international cooperation through exchange of ideas and perspectives. We are very pleased to announce that today's dialogue is co-hosted with eSpace, EPFL Lausanne, and focuses on orbital debris remediation. The dialogue will be moderated by Mary Valentin Florine. Mary Valentin Florine is the Executive Director of the International Risk Governance Center at, or IRGC at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. The IRGC is a multi-stakeholder platform that provides evidence-based knowledge relevant to public policy. Under Mary Valentin's leadership, the IRGC has developed guidelines for governing emerging and systemic risks and recommendations for ensuring the environmental sustainability of emerging space technologies. In 2021, the IRGC published a report titled Collision Risk from Space Debris, Current Status, Challenges and Response Strategies. In the same year, it published a policy brief titled Policy Options to Address Collision Risk from Space Debris. And we are really glad to have you as the moderator, Mary Valentin. So with that introduction, over to you, Mary. Thank you very much, uh, Shreya, for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, let me briefly uh, introduce our four panelists. Uh, first, uh, there will be, uh, we have Emmanuel David. Uh, Emmanuel is the executive director of the space of the eSpace Center at EPFL, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, same as where I am. And eSpace um, is an interdisciplinary hub uh, working with students, academic institutions, international space agencies, and industry partners with an overall mission to promote space related research and education at EPFL. And Emmanuel also has 12, 10 years of experience in space transportation in academia, agency, and industry from pre-development projects to up to launch operations. Welcome, Emmanuel. I would also like to uh, welcome Shreyas Mirji. Um, Shreyas uh, leads business and strategy for Digantara. Uh, he's been involved with uh, space safety and sustainability over the past five years from product development to policy making and to engineering. And prior to his work on space safety, Shreyas was involved in research focused on fluid behavior in microgravity. Then we have also Romain Bux. Uh, Romain is a space analyst at Clear Space, uh, where he leads strategic policy initiatives and supports licensing across uh, Clear Space various missions. Um, Roma coordinates clear space policy effort to make space activities safer and more sustainable. And as you understand, this is the topic of today's webinar. Uh, he worked previously at IRGC, where he led the work that led to the, to the two reports that uh, Shreya just mentioned. And uh, finally, we have uh, also Ashok, uh, Ashok GV. Um, Ashok is a dispute Resolution Council, and he represents clients in various sectors in domestic and international dispute resolution. His uh, service areas cover contract violations, company law proceedings, uh, prosecution, and IP rights enforcement. 
And um, Ashok is also the director of legal affairs at Spaceport Sarabai. So uh, we are all four of us with you today, and uh, we're going to walk you through a number of issues related to uh, space safety and sustainability, including debris med remediation. As uh, Shreya introduced, um, we would like to focus on, on discussing the, 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 the question of space and, and sustainability. And I would, I would say um, this is probably because the space sector is, is hosting a diversity of scientific and commercial activities that are really vital to terrestrial security and welfare. And space sustainability has become a necessary and urgent field of human endeavor. If, if I would tell you, as reminded in a recent paper by Joanne Wheeler, that 35 out of 45 essential variables defined by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, are measured from space, uh, then we begin to understand how expanding public and increasingly commercial activities in space are raising challenges for space sustainability. Uh, we also we have a lot of concerns related to um, the danger of space debris, the potential for damage to orbiting satellites, and uh, and orbital crowding and atmospheric pollution. So with that a quick introduction, I will right away move to asking a few questions to the to the panelists. And um, so I will begin with a first general question um, to each of, of you. Uh, how do you define safety and sustainability in space? And how do you establish the contours of, or the components of safety and sustainability? How are the two concepts, safety, human safety, and sus sustainability, short-term and long-term, you know, um, uh, reconciled and managed or, or related? At least, how are they related? And, and also, can I ask you how, um, I mean, in a few sentences, what you're doing? Uh, in this domain, and we'll go in some details later. So let me begin with um, Emmanuel, please. Um, how do you define these two concepts of safety mm -hmm. operations and sustainability in space? Thank you, Maria Valentin, for this uh, great question, which actually uh, is a research topic by itself. Um, but I would start that um, for me also, according to, so to my perception, so but when we talk about safety, uh, I see more the engineering aspect, which is uh, related also to the um, spacecraft for a mission, uh, not to the non-failure of the mission, to avoid a system that fails and triggers ca catastrophic uh, events. Also ensure that there will not be some collisions in space or harm to other objects. And when we talk about sustainability, I, I usually go back to the definition of um, the, the uh, United Nations, uh, which also underlines that uh, space activities, the sustainable space activities, uh, should should uh, long should be in the long term also, and also for the future generation. Now also at EPFL, uh, we also work in defining what is space sustainability, and one of the aspects tool we are using is the space sustainability rating, and I, I will come maybe more in details to that later. But this also proposes one definition of uh, of uh, space sustainability, which is measurable, and this is uh, very important. For me, safety and sustainability are uh, really interrelated, and um, but sustainability is is broader, as it also takes into consideration uh, the economic and the social aspect of the use of space and its resources. And safety is one part of sustainability. Um, and what do we do in this domain at EPFL? So we work a lot around space sustainability. This since uh, 2009, where it started with a project called Clean Space One that led to the creation of the startup for Clear Space, in which Romain is uh, working now. Uh, so I will let also Romain have to talk more about uh, Clear Space actions. Um, but we also launched in 2022, as I mentioned, uh, the space sustainability rating. Uh, association in collaboration with the ESA Space Study Office, MIT, Bryce Tech, and Texas at Austin. And finally, now uh, we launched uh, earlier this year the uh, Space Sustainability Hub, uh, which is connecting all the individual projects uh, within EPFL uh, around the thematic of space sustainability, around three pillars which are measure, understand, and act for space sustainability. So measure to fill the gaps of, in the unknown, 
uh, especially with the space uh, object population, understand to analyze and quantify the space environment risk and the impact on the, on the environment, and to act in order to include this assessment in space function design since early design phase, and also to link it with policy measures and to advocate for space sustainability. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for these, um, these, these uh, introductory words. Uh, can I ask the same question to Shreyas? Uh, what does it sure. mean space and sustainability, perhaps the role of um, uh, remediation in it? Uh, yes, yeah. Sure, thank you so much, Maria, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, like Emmanuel said, uh, it's definitely a, a whole thesis topic in itself, but in terms of simplifying what uh, safety and sustainability would mean, um, especially if it goes to space safety, you're not only talking about the human safety, but also on the spacecraft side and not just in orbit, but also on the terrestrial side as well. It is uh, space safety, uh, to put it in a simple words, is to ensure how, what measures you can take to ensure that the spacecraft you are sending in is both safe to operate on its own as, as well as not cause any effect to, in terms of um, to other objects, both on space and as well as on land. But in terms of uh, what are the key differentiality between uh, uh, safety and sustainability, it's more of a causality is what I see. Uh, there is, uh, like uh, Emmanuel said, it's a subset of uh, sustainability. So whatever steps you take on the uh, safety side would translate itself to how do we ensure the uh, space remains accessible accessible to the future of humankind. Uh, and I think that's basically sum up uh, uh, the relationship between space safety and sustainability at this moment in time. And coming to point as to what uh, we do, uh, I represent a company called Digantara. Uh, we are a end-to-end -end, uh, space situational awareness company that is developing end-to-end -end infrastructure for space operations and space traffic management. Uh, to give a, a little bit more depth into understanding of our uh, what we do, uh, I would like to quote uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, he spoke about situational awareness uh, during the Iraq war. And of course, the situation is different, but I think what it holds to, he says that, you know, uh, when it comes to situational awareness, you talk about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Uh, so on the known knowns front, what we're doing is we act as a verification layer for uh, objects in low Earth or orbit, and we are able to uh, understand where those exact precise positions are. Uh, in terms of known unknowns, uh, what we specialize in is to uh, map and track uh, orbital debris and uh, other assets between one and 10 centimeter. That's our uh, core goal. And in terms of no unknown unknowns, now we have a set of space situational awareness data that is currently available. How do we use this data to make uh, effective analytics of it for uh, to help anyone who's going to go to space to operate uh, safely and effectively basically contribute towards a uh, sustainable use of outer space. Uh, I'll leave it to that. I think you're on mute, Mary. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very clear indeed. Um, a very clear introduction. Um, let's now move to Romain. Romain, what are you doing at Clear Space and how do you um, address the, both safety and, and sustainability aspects. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with Clear Space first uh, and then come to the safety and sustainability. Uh, so Clear Space is an in-orbit servicing company uh, founded in 2018 uh, in Switzerland and now with offices uh, in different places in, in Europe. Uh, we are developing services in orbit to make sure that satellites are no longer left stranded in orbit at end of life or that we can make use of them longer uh, such that those stop being single use items. Uh, it's uh, um, a path towards being able to recycle, refurbish uh, and, and have a more resilient and more sustainable infrastructure because we are reusing things and not uh, discarding them. We are working mostly on two types of mission at the moment, some to remove derelict objects from orbit for the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency and also working to extend the life of um, telecom satellites in, in GEO, uh, where they usually perform well after their um, planned design life, but have no more fuel uh, to be operated. Um, I think that those, those two kind of activities work towards uh, more safety and sustainability. So I see safety more as a, as a shorter term goal usually, and more focused on, on the I mean, limiting the risk of damage to uh, assets and people on the ground and in space. 
Um, and, and in that regard, removing derelict objects and, and safely doing a safe control reentry, for example, for an object limits the risk on the ground, so it's safer and also safer in orbit because you reduce the debris could create in a collision. So that's that's one first step. And, and in the longer term, you reduce the amount of debris in orbit um, and, and thus the risk of collision to, to spacecraft. Uh, so I think for me, sustainability goes more into this idea of being able to keep getting the benefits from this um, uh, natural resource that is uh, space uh, orbits around Earth. And, and by removing and, and making better use of assets there, we, we are going towards uh, more sustainable space activities. Thank you very much, Roman. Uh, also very clear introduction. And, and uh, finally, let's move to uh, Ashok. Ashok, would, would you, um, how do you think about these concepts and uh, what do you do in your, in your work for that? Uh, thank you, Marie. So I think from uh, my point of view as a lawyer who advises the commercial space industry, um, I have to take what is obviously a very complex and a very uh, uh, you know, large topic and try and ensure that it is expressed in a language that my clientele understands. Mm -hmm. And I found that often the best way to do that is to say that if you don't do ABCD things, then chances are that you'll run a fall of international law. And that usually does the work. So uh, for me, I think uh, the simplest way in terms of how I define safety and sustainability of space activities is to tell my client that whatever helps you avoid liability under the liability convention, that is safe, responsible, and a sustainable way to conduct space activities. And it's an overly simplistic definition. I understand that. But I've often found that it's the easiest way to start the conversation and to steer the thinking in that direction. And as part of the work that I do, uh, one is, of course, to help my clients define their uh, technology and business objectives in a manner that best complements uh, sustainability goals and uh, you know incorporates best practices and space situational awareness. And on the other hand, uh, we also then work with uh, you know uh, companies that are into launch services, companies that provide satellite as a service option, and help them define contractual terms and conditions in a way that best reflects the international legal position, uh, allocates risks very clearly and very specifically. Uh, the idea being that if the, the risk is clearly allocated, then the parties to the space activity will clearly know who is responsible for what, and therefore they go about uh, ensuring that uh, they're not negligent in the process. We also work with uh, you know, domestic policy makers in terms of helping them define policy around some of these things. Uh, oftentimes we get questions of, uh, should we go with, for example, uncontrolled re-entry as the debris mitigation guidelines? So on these questions, we weigh in with our uh, inputs and then see how we can help shape policy in the right direction. Excellent. Um, uh, thank you. I think your work uh, to, um, um, to establish, I mean, to recommend or to advise ex ante is, is really the kind of things that, 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 that is, 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 is must be done at this, at this moment. So, um, um, I mean, just, just before we move to the second uh, round of questions, I, I wanted to um, just uh, um, remind the definition of sustainability for the for both uh, the, uh, the I mean, as 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 said in the the guidelines for long term sustainability of outer space activities uh, developed by the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and and this according to this uh, the definition of sustainability is the ability to maintain the conduct of space activities indefinitely into the future in a manner that realizes the objectives of equitable access to the benefits of the exploration and use of outer space for peaceful purposes in order to meet the, the, the needs of the present generations while preserving the outer space environment for future generations. So there's very much this question of short-term needs and long-term long -term, um, uh, future. Yeah. And, and, and similarly, the, the International or the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, the IADC, um, uh, developed, uh, as you know, the first set of guidelines uh, around space debris mitigations and, uh, and mentions that uh, any activity that takes place in the outer space should be performed while recognizing the unique nature of the law of the, um, uh, the orbits, the, both LEO and GEO, to ensure this future safe and sustainable use. So IADC puts safety and sustainability together, and that makes a lot of sense for, 
for many of us and in particular for, 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 for industry and operators. So thank you for this uh, first um, 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 questions. Now I would like to go back to each of you and ask you more specific questions. And let me begin with Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you mentioned the space sustainability rating and we're, I'd be curious to hear more about that, but also to hear you about what especially, or perhaps in your experience with the SSR, so the, Swiss, the, the space sustainability rating, what is how do you perceive the role of industry and, and governments and international bodies on the enforcement of space safety and sustainability guidelines? Do you see that companies are increasingly recognizing the value of environmental responsible business practices or the value of, of engaging for um, sustainability? How does industry react to that? Thank you, uh, Marie Hanchi, for those very accurate questions. Um, so, in terms of um, so the space sustainability rating uh, was initiated, um, I would say, 2015, 2016, within the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Space, that came uh, with the idea to develop the a rating. And why why did they come to this? Because they realized that um, so at the World Economic Forum, it's more some pri private uh, actors. Um, but also from, from different backgrounds, that the international, I would say, legislation, uh, which could also be binding, is going very slow, the development, in order to come to an international consensus. And also, uh, especially at the UN, it's going towards, uh, they came out with the long-term sustainability guidelines, which is not legally binding also. Uh, so, um, and if we were to wait for the, those um, forums to, to take strong measures, it, it can take a still a long, long time, as we also can see uh, in the uh, global warming uh, debates also. This is why there was the, the idea also to come up with, um, uh, uh, with a, a way also to, to um, push, I would say, actors to act in a more sustainable uh, matter and also to be able to advertise about positive behavior and uh, not going into a, a way to do some naming and shaming who are the bad actors, but more to, uh, uh, to reward good behaviors and good actors and then to push everyone uh, up. And this is how um, the first version of the rating uh, was developed uh, with a consortium composed by the ESA Space Debris Office, MIT, UT Texas at Austin and Rice Tech, uh, where they defined the rating, did a lot of stakeholder consultations to understand which would be the parameters that they want to take into account, and especially also uh, where are also the parameters that we can measure and that the research is also um, mature enough and that everyone agrees on it. So that, therefore, the mission of the rating is really to encourage space actors to design and implement sustainable space missions and operation. And it's developed, and the rating is developed around, around different modules that assess the impact on the space environment, the ability also to be detected, tracked, and identified, how the operator share the data, the compliance to the international guidelines and regulation, the capacity to perform collisions and uh, uh, collision avoidance maneuver and also the capacity also to be compatible to servicing missions. And our idea, so so far we've been um, we got a lot of attraction of different type of actors, should be startups and big operators. So we see that there is a strong interest by the industry uh, to be rated and should it be also mainly so in, in Europe in in America. Uh, but we also have a partnership with the Nihon University in Japan, and we are also want to expand also to other, I would say, uh, region uh, worldwide. Um, and, uh, and and I think exactly the the, the industry is is get, uh, understanding this value also of uh, of um, of being more more sustainable. However, we also get also often the comment that as long as it's not something that they have to enforce, they some other actors might not do it. I would say it's easy to preach for the one who are convinced, but the one who are not yet convinced or don't see the value, it's, it's more complicated. And this is why in a second step, we could also see that the rating could be used to support public procurement, 
uh, also to can be linked also to national uh, legislation as being a tool also for uh, um, at the national and international level to assess the level of sustainability of, of missions and then to push also to more, for more sustainable missions. Mm -hmm. So you are on the side of those who say we need to have positive reward, basically reward good behavior. Exactly. Uh, instead or in addition to punish. You don't, you're not involved in the punishment, but you're involved in the positive reward. Yeah, know? it's about nudging, exactly. Reward and and um, and um, act on reputational matters um, uh, that will create um, uh, willingness to, to work with. Yes. Excellent. Moving Thanks. now to SSA. Okay, space situational awareness. Um, and this is a question for, for, for Shreyas. So we have uh, space situational awareness, which is really at the basis of, um, which is a foundational to debris, any re debris related action. Um, SSA supports STM, uh, so space traffic management, as well as space environmental management and, and dealing with the debris. In um, a few weeks ago, in January 2023, the Gantara launched its second satellite to monitor yeah. space weather for enhancing precision-driven SSA applications. So what is the role, the exact role of SSA to ensure safety and sustainability? What are the opportunities for other actors? Great question, right? So if you look at uh, the low earth environment uh, over, the, over the last 50, 60 years, uh, the major activities have predominantly been through state actors and, and, and the uh, and the debris or the objects that are currently there is because of that. and there had not much been any public participation, private participation at just at that point in time. But now with, you know, increased uh, faster access to space and cheaper access to space, now even a company like us have the opportunity to go to space. We can hear that uh, people say that most of the companies are space companies right now. We have, um, you know, multiple applications that are, uh, you know, we could use towards uh, building value here on Earth. But if you look at the operational envelope in the orbit, it's really, really limited. All the space is really vast. It's really limited. I'll ask you this question, right? Would you be comfortable uh, knowing the situation, how uh, the planes fly? Would you be uh, comfortable knowing that air traffic control is not there today? Would you be happy to take a flight from here to Munich or you know some other region, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty in, in the situation around uh, spatial situation right now. So, and the same thing uh, drives to uh, space sector as well. Now there are companies launching mega constellation of satellites uh, and with coupled with the debris that is currently uh, in place, uh, it is very much important for us to understand uh, with, with much higher degree of accuracy where these objects are. And even the current infrastructure that is already in place for space situational awareness has, has come out as a byproduct of a Cold War or for missile driving, missile tracking systems in itself. So we right now, we need that infrastructure layer, just like air traffic control for uh, aircraft for us to effectively monitor what happens in low Earth orbit and uh, and give a precise uh, understanding about the positions of these objects. And I, and I think uh, when it comes to space situation awareness, there's also a, a space where the plays a very intrinsic role as well, because it has uh, immense effect on, on objects between one and 10 centimeters. So the, the satellites that we launched initially, or are the first two satellites that we launched uh, predominantly to ensure that uh, to track a space weather in near Earth orbit and, and ensure how this would apply uh, to space situational awareness and derive precise models for, uh, for to help uh, enable actors who are going to go to space to understand where these objects are. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shreyas. Yeah. So, Roman, when we prepared this, um, this, um, this webinar, uh, you said to me that um, um, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, uh, so, I, I, I mean, what, what's your view on, on should, we, should we focus or prioritize debris mitigation rather than remediation? If mitigation refers to technical procedures or requirements for operational spacecraft aimed at reducing the risk that they become or generate debris, so before, and remediation is after um, and can take the form of active debris removal or just in time collision avoidance or on other perhaps more fancy ways to um, get rid of these debris. What, what's, what's your, what, what are your views on that? Do we need space debris remediation? 
What's... Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> the, the short answer is yes, we do. Uh, the, the longer one is, um, I think it's it's interesting in that case because you you what is prevention and where is what do you prevent? Mm -hmm. So the first thing you prevent is using your, your satellite. So mitigation is prevention, but remediation, removing a dead satellite from orbit, is also prevention. You prevent this satellite from colliding with something else that will then become a cloud of debris, which is going to be a problem. So you can see mitigation, and I mean, the boundary is sometimes hard to define, but there's all the procedure, all the things that operators can do to make sure they're able to get out of orbit when they no longer need to be there. And, and this, this don't need to stop. This needs to be done better. Um, I mean, we the, in the current guidelines, um, the post-mission disposal success rate target is 90%. That would mean that like one out of 10, you can miss the, uh, the, the, the deorbiting, but you should be able to do it for all the other satellites you have. And we know that for large constellations, this is probably not enough. And that's only a first step because you, you can try and do your best while you have the ability to remove your satellite. But once you no longer have the disability, you should have a service to be able to remove that satellite and make sure it doesn't leave, it doesn't stay in orbit and doesn't create more uh, debris if it collides or, or explode. So um, I think that's, that's we, we, those two things have to work in tandem. Uh, we won't abandon mitigation. Mitigation is probably cheaper than remediation overall, but as you go at higher and higher level of mitigation, mitigation gets more and more expensive. Making your satellite reliable at 99.9% .9 is very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. So you'd better not do that. And if you lose it, have the ability to go pick it up. Um, so we need, we need both. Uh, they will work together. And, and why do we need remediation? And more in general is that um, we now know that even if we stop launching satellites, the number of objects in orbit will keep growing due to collision. Um, if we had started really good mitigation practice from the very beginning, we might never have needed the remediation. The, the fact, is, as Shrey has mentioned, is that we've left, I mean, through national uh, operations and national programs and the space race, we've left a lot of objects uh, in orbit that are very large. And if they collide, they generate thousands of small pieces of debris. And so we are too late in the process not to have remediation. And as we launch more and more spacecraft and have more crowded orbits, uh, this becomes more and more important to remove objects. Um, and I think that's, I mean, we see it with, with the growth of the traffic. Uh, we see through modeling as well, where we uh, look at how the population evolve under different scenarios. And, and it's, it becomes clear that there's a need to, to remove uh, some, some derelict objects. And I think in general, it's more about even a mindset where you stop, you stop thinking that you can just leave your stuff there at the end. Mm -hmm. And that's it's everyone's responsibility to do their best uh to to remove direct objects at, at at that point uh there's no service readily available on the market so you cannot go to an operator and say hey you have to pick it up now uh once it's there uh this i think it's going to change a bit the the equation and and how people view this as leaving your your trash in space is there is there any kind of priority that we should have on removing um small objects small debris versus large debris large objects um, so the, there's different metrics you can use to assess the risk of the objects, and they all have some, let's say, value base that is very difficult to uh, measure. At first, we don't know exactly. You can look at the revenue satellites have. You can try to, uh, to look at which, what would be the consequences of collisions in different orbital regions. But it's, it's very difficult because we don't know in 10 or 15 years what benefits we might get from that region. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, there's an agreement that um, the most dangerous objects are clustered large rocket bodies that are about nine tons and that come close together uh, a few times a year. And they have the highest risk of colliding and would generate a lot of 
small debris pieces. So I think that the, the focus is is on uh, effectiveness is there, but uh, it's it's becomes everyone's responsibility then to remove their objects in yeah. their operational orbits, which also have impacts on their their operations. Absolutely, yes, makes sense. Yeah, thank you very much. And still now, um, still on remediation. Um, and now we, we're going to move now with uh, Ashok on 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 legal matters. And um, and in particular uh, on um, uh, domestic national regulation. So um, if I understand correctly, Ashok, but please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm wrong. National regulatory authorities can mandate or could mandate or incentivize the adoption of what I would describe as best available cost-effective technologies. Okay, I mean not the, the not the, those that are not yet um, uh, effective or, or, or available or, or cost efficient. Uh, so technologies for space debris mitigation and remediation. But what, what is your view about the importance of these national laws? Uh, how are they important in contrast to international regulations, perhaps? How can they promote effectively uh, good behavior, responsible behavior um, in, in space? And, and speci specifically around debris, um, debris remediation, yes, yeah, or mitigation, yeah. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, from, from uh, advising, say, a commercial space actor uh, undertaking space activities, I think the challenge is, is this, right? Uh, in a country like, for example, India, where uh, clear, clearly defined regulations are yet to emerge, and what you see is a is a series of say contractually defined obligations on what what can happen and what cannot. Uh, there are always challenges in terms of uh, advising of an actor on what are the precise contours of the liability they're staring at. And I think what that does, if I'm not able to precisely define to them what the regulatory requirements are, uh, the precise areas of risk are unknown, and that then raises a series of questions on what kind of insurance coverage is available. What is the kind of premium that I'll have to pay for it? What are the inclusions in the insurance policy and what will be the exclusions? Right? And what has happened, especially in the recent past, uh, specific to orbital debris, is that there are different signals coming from different jurisdictions. Uh, the space bear debris mitigation guidelines, for example, I think prescribes controlled uh, you know, mitigation of LEO uh, you know, space assets, for example. Uh, but we also saw that the uh, the U.S. government came back and uh, said they're okay with the concept of uncontrolled reentry. Now, when we have to sit down and really get to the question of uh, how do I understand my responsibility and what is the potential liability, if I'm going to advise a, you know, an actor to probably employ controlled reentry versus uncontrolled reentry, uh, for them the the next big answer is why don't I go and do this out of the U.S. because their uncontrolled reentry is permissible and therefore more cost effective. So I think having clearly defined national regulations is, is definitely important in terms of incentivizing as mm -hmm. well as deterring irresponsible behavior. But at the same time, I think it's important that some kind of common standards emerge for guidelines and regulations across jurisdictions, because we are in the era of globalization. And what happens is if one jurisdiction becomes overly restrictive or, uh, or imposes an excessively deterrent uh, you know, posture, it is possible for businesses to jump to a different jurisdiction. And the other big problem is that liability is still a known unknown in terms of jurisprudence, because there are not too many case laws or not too many case studies under the liability convention, which will help us understand the precise limits and, and extent of liability. So I think all this creates an era of an area of uncertainty, which only national regulation can address and, and through, through bringing in a, appropriate guidelines. And until that happens, I think it's, it's, fear inducing uh, it's uh, venturing into the unknown and uh, that that has a debilitating effect on everything from investor sentiment to uh, you know things like getting insurance so there is an absolute need to bring in regulation just to be able to clearly define the do's and don'ts mm -hmm. are you optimistic on this yeah, absolutely I think uh, the, the one thing that i can confidently speak about my country is that we are very scared about what can go wrong so I'm very confident that we will see some guidelines and regulations coming in to prevent, uh, you know, debris in space and to advocate for uh, remediation. Mm -hmm. And this could influence other countries to do the same, I guess. Yeah. 
I think that's the way international law on the subject is going to evolve. I think it's going to be countries taking initiatives and then other countries probably following suit or at least entering into a debate. But I think that's how international law will evolve in the days to come. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. So um, let's move on to um, uh, another topic, uh, which is around problems and challenges. And uh, of course, um, um, solutions also, in particular, perhaps regarding the role of um, for policy to provide the kind of impetus that is needed to find solutions to overcome the challenges. Let me begin with a few, um, um, I mean, uh, the conclusions from the work that uh, we in IRGC did uh, two years ago with Romain and as mentioned by Shreya in the introduction. We saw a number of challenges around, first, the low level of compliance with internationally agreed upon mitigation guidelines. So low level of compliance. Second, um, that mechanisms primarily only address, address the creation of new pieces of debris, but do not address the legacy of derelict objects. And uh, Romain mentioned that. Third, that um, uh, national requirements involve the evaluation of emissions potential space debris creation before launch, but uh, they only weakly incentivize operators to reduce the risk of debris creation once in orbit. And fourth, that um, um, uh, there is a very slow pace of discussion at the international level uh, with no binding or more detailed agreement in sight. So we, we saw these four challenges related to, um, to how policy and in particular, uh, particular how international policy could um, work effectively towards uh, debris remedi I mean, remedi remediating this, this problem of debris to ensure both safety and sustainability. But what are the specific challenges that each of you in your respective domains see? Let's let's begin perhaps with Emmanuel again. Yes, what are the main challenges you see? So um, I will talk about one aspect which I find uh, very important in terms of challenges is about uh, the definition of space sustainability and how you measure and you assess space sustainability. Uh, because this is also very different from a uh, different perspective of actors and from uh, regions also about the world. And um, that's why also on this, the scientific community also needs to come to a global consensus on uh, what are the criteria and also agree on the targets. Uh, it's a bit uh, like in the climate change, what is the 1.5 degree of uh, space uh, in this case? And we see that for climate change, it took over 30 years to come to this uh, consensus. So let's hope we are a bit faster about the space sustainability. And as you mentioned also, uh, one, the big challenge also uh, is also the slow pace of the discussion at the international level. And there's really an urgent need to have a multi-stakeholder, multi-level actions, both coming from the top, from uh, like at the UN level, uh, but also from the bottom, also from people coming, proposing also solutions uh, within different uh, regions, and also maybe sideways, people outside the space community that come and, and also uh, come into the discussion. So bring all actors to the table. Yeah, we need uh, more than... Also, because uh, you need to uh, have different perspective also. Yeah, so all also... actors and from all countries, yes. Exactly. Um, thank you. And also, I, I want to, to flag, yes, what you said uh, before about the definition and uh, how to measure sustainability, because as we know, if we can't measure something, it's more complicated to address it. Yeah. So, uh, Shreyas, what are the views on these challenges and, uh, and perhaps uh, in particular reg regarding to operational, uh, I mean, operational challenges regarding to SSA? Yeah, I think uh, we are seeing, uh, like Emmanuel mentioned, that you know there is enough problems on the uh, you know on the policy side and how to get people on the same table. I think uh, the same thing can be a sort of extended to the on the operational side uh, for space situation awareness. Uh, I would like to point there are two main problems or other bottlenecks that we see. One is on the data side, and the second is on um, what are the rules of the road. And I think I'll answer both of these questions, you know, you know, one by one way. Uh, in, when it comes to data, again, uh, there are two problems associated with the data. If I were to uh, track one particular object right now, and if there are three different uh, um, the people who are measuring the data, you would get three different locations uh, in, in on, the, on the chart to see, you know, which is the accurate. So you really don't know which is the most accurate data set. How do we validate that? 
Uh, so that's the first problem when it comes to data. And, and the second problem associated with the data we see is right now we have the capability to track objects up to just 10 centimeter in size. A best case scenario, we can go up to a five to eight centimeters. But again, that just accounts for about four to five percent of the total objects uh, in orbit. Then there is something called uh, lethal but non-trackable objects that is between one and 10 centimeter. When you see that, uh, we don't have any uh, technology that is currently out there uh, which can effectively map and track these objects. So one is with respect to the, the kind of data sets that is actually missing, and another one is the how accurate we are able to measure the data. And I think that is one of the problem we are solving at the Gantara also. But I think this is the main problem that we have in the industry where you know we really don't know how good the data is. Uh, that's something that people in the SSA industry are actually trying to solve it right now as we speak, because if you don't have good data, whatever you do downstream won't have any effect uh, in terms of on the operational and even on the safe, uh, space safety side. Uh, moving uh, to the second point uh, is basically on the rules of the road. Now that we have multiple jurisdictions working, um, how people assess the risk is still a question. Some people consider uh, the probability of collision as, as one kind of measure of the risk. And some people consider uh, there's also missed distance. So uh, again, there are various thresholds people uh, assign uh, for them to take actions on. One person's uh, threshold limit can be other person's warning. So there is no set rules of the road that people can follow. And there have been instances where things can as small, uh, be as small as communication. Uh, one person following one set of threshold values and than the other. Uh, there have been genuine disagreements between operate, owner operators at, uh, over the last few years where there, there would have been serious potential collisions. How do we avoid that? So there is a, there's a lack in consensus in, in terms of the rules of the road, I think, but I think that's the problem that we as an industry are solving uh, through working groups, uh, so on and so forth. But uh, it, it takes time for uh, when nations become states become involved, how do we to get the consensus? The private sector can come to a consensus, but how do we now consider the legal legality of the, uh, you know, the, the situation and get everyone to the same table and agree upon it? Thank you. So, so these two problems, data, data quality problem and, and rules of the road. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, Romain? Any 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 special challenge you'd like uh, specific challenges you'd like to um, to emphasize uh, around uh, perhaps space debris remediation, active debris removal, on orbit uh, servicing, and in in general the role of policy. Sure. Um, so in in the case of debris removal, most people when they think about challenges are often focused on the legal aspects. And the question of whether you can remove someone else debris and how would that work uh, because we know that um, the state of registry retain jurisdiction and control over the objects and the launching states remain liable for, for those objects uh, even if they've been abandoned um, so that's those are challenges but those are not uh, the biggest ones uh, because um, of course, some dangerous objects will need to find ways to agree on their removal. But at the moment, uh, the key question is more the economics. It's more how do you finance uh, those, um, those missions? Um, there's, of course, an interest in reducing the, the liability, which is um, not always well defined. It's, as, as Ashok mentioned, not a lot of precedent, so it's hard for um, for companies and states in general to, to make the case for the removal of their objects because of the liability that is attached to, to those objects. So I think in, in general is finding the, the good way to um, have operators remove their objects, engage in remediation, and it's both about reducing the cost of the services because if the cost is prohibitive, there's no way to... Uh, to make this uh, used uh, on a general general basis, but this is also about uh, raising the incentives for the use of those services, and that's where policy can help, mm -hmm. and that's what regulators are already uh, trying to do in in different ways. It it can happen through uh, licensing where they impose some uh, requirements. Um, 
for example, the FCC has recently on, on some of the license of the, the constellation imposed some limitations uh, if they lose too many satellites. They have to pose and they re will review the license. So these are steps uh, in the direction where we where policy makes um, the remediation more attractive. Um, and, and I think that in the coming years, as the remediation of offer grows, regulators will be also more um, ready to, um, to have uh, more incentives uh, for those services in general. Thank you very much, Roman. Um, that's that's and, also very clear. Yeah. And maybe just just to conclude, this one not to forget is that it's technically challenging. Uh, it's it's not easy, um, and and if it's not been really done yet, it's not. It's also because I mean, it's because of lack of funding, lack of interest, different things. But uh, it's a harsh environment. Communication is difficult. It's far away. And objects been there for a long time, and we don't always know exactly in what shape, how they rotate, and and so making it happen technically is also also a challenge. But I don't think it's the it's the biggest one uh, for the for the coming years. It's more about making it scale and and having the right incentives uh, for the for the for such services. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And finally, Ashok, um, views about major challenges, um, solutions, what policy solutions do you think are the most promising? So I think, uh, I mean, one of the conversations that we have been having in India is, um, uh, I mean, like it was said many times before, it's technically challenging, uh, it could be expensive. Uh, and we especially have a very nascent but very robust, uh, you know, ecosystem of new age startups coming into space activities. And uh, one of the interesting suggestions has been doing the rounds is setting up of a fund that can address questions of liability. And uh, to my mind, I think an interesting proposal would be to not just use the fund to address claims of liability, but also use the fund to prevent liability in the first place by subsidizing technologies that can help mitigate and, re and remedy issues of orbital debris. And I think uh, there will be some uh, level of out of the box policy thinking and leadership that is required. For example, uh, can we incentivize, uh, you know, uh, easier regulatory streamline for companies that come with a plan for orbital debris mitigation, uh, as opposed to subjecting other companies for a more regimented regulatory uh, process? Can we uh, perhaps, uh, you know, prescribe some, uh, you know, rebates on insurance premium? If you can demonstrate that you have a tangible uh, you know, plan in place for orbital debris uh, you know, remediation, uh, can we have, say, uh, tax incentives uh, you know, for, for investing in technologies of this nature? Can we look at tax holidays for companies that are doing R&D in this sector? So I think a lot of the, uh, the solutions will probably not lie just within the domain of space policy. It can probably come within the domain of uh, fiscal policy. It can come within the domain of insurance regulations. It can come in the domain of uh, you know various other subjects of uh, law. And to me, uh, a great way to actually uh, achieve a certain level of uh, predictability in regulations is also to fall back on jurisprudence in environmental law and see how we can apply some of those principles on orbital debris remediation and, and mitigation. So I think the challenges are plenty, but uh, this kind of, we have precedents in terms of say the 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 uh, the uh, the sea, uh, you know things like the forest, mm -hmm. and we have to see how we can adapt those principles to the subject of outer space. Uh, but yes, the challenges are of course out there. But I think that uh, I mean as a lawyer, I firmly believe that policy is a great way to start with the uh, with the solutions, and I think these are some ways in which we can propose some out of the box solutions and try and achieve responsible uh, behavior in outer space. Mm -hmm. No, I think definitely learning from others is also very, very useful. And there are lots of things that can be learned from other domains and um, especially uh, in the natural environment on Earth, yes. Um, now, we have a few more minutes um, uh, that I would like to spend um, on asking some of the questions that are in the Q&A, um, uh, the, the, the Q&A and the chat uh, spaces. Um, so I would like uh, to encourage the panelists uh, to look at uh, these questions uh, first in the chat, uh, where there are, question, there are a few questions, uh, at least one question for each of you, and, um, and, um, 
And then we also have uh, quite relevant questions in the in the the, the Q and A uh, in the question asked by the audience by the audience in this webinar. So um, uh, some some of the questions have been uh, uh, sort of asked already, but I would like to since I want to give some time to the panelists to look at these questions, I would like to to take the first question in the the Q and A, which is. Um, is there anything about uh, how space debris results in climate change? Uh, is there any possibility that that space debris and space activity cause climate change? And uh, I don't have the, the solution to this question, and I, I know it's, it's a question of large debate, but Emmanuel has uh, her hand raised, she, she has worked on that. And indeed, um, uh, I would say um, there are lots of kind of physical uh, things that can happen as a result in particular of, of debris re-entering space. And um, uh, Emmanuel, what's, what, what's your, what, what, what are your views on that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's a very good question. So uh, in terms of the impact of space mission on the environment, when you go to space already, and, um, and also when you re-enter. And so we have a project currently to assess environmental impact, to develop a framework on how to assess environmental impact for space transportation. And uh, actually we see that there's a very few data on the impact of launchers on the environment. And especially now with the increase of uh, launch, uh, the impact will be even more bigger. And just when you think about a rocket, a uh, dispensable rocket that are one use, uh, you see the boosters of uh, big launchers that are just falling into the ocean, uh, also the burning of the gas uh, mm -hmm. in the atmosphere. Uh, so this is uh, very critical to, to look at this and to assess also this, uh, this impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, also during uh, re-entry. So this is why, for example, reusability is also a solution, but still you burn a lot of uh, fuel uh, when, when you launch. And during re-entry, uh, it's true that when you re-enter, uh, the uh, satellite can, can burn uh, in the atmosphere, but we don't know exactly what are the impacts on, on the atmosphere and the different layers also. And uh, it's okay when it's one satellite once in a while, but with the increase of the space traffic and more objects, there's also there is a very a big lack of, uh, of data on those topics. And, um, and then the research uh, has to, to push for that. So it's a very good uh, uh, topic and it's also mm -hmm. an urgent issue to, to research. On. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can indeed increase the albedo and have a, have a cooling effect um, as well as a worsening effect. So it can have both, in fact, yes. Mm -hmm. When, when, when uh, debris re-enter the atmosphere and vaporize. Um, is there a candidate to begin with the other questions we had uh, we had uh, to ask? Um, Shreyas, I see you are unmuted. Uh, would you go please with your question to you? Can you please uh, summarize the question? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about how effective are long-term sustainability guidelines for your companies and are they sufficient enough to address the issue? Uh, yes, uh, to sum up uh, in a one word, yes, it is enough uh, for us to, to address the issue, but more comes into implementation. How many people are ready to, you know, inculcate these? Uh, what gives them the incentive to take these guidelines and implement within the company? So that's a question that needs to be answered. And again, going back to even Ashok on answering on the previous question, right? How do we incentivize the uh, uh, the participants in the space ecosystem to comply to these guidelines? That's where the question uh, answer lies. But um, in but, but the short answer is yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, back also to question to something that was discussed uh, with Romain. Uh, there's a comment in the chat that says that, as all of us uh, must be aware, a recent NASA study assessed cost and benefit of orbital debris removal, and the analysis, which looked at both the cost of establishing various approaches to removing debris as well as the cost incurred by satellite operators from debris, found the most effective approaches involved ground and space-based lasers to remove large amounts of small debris between one and 10 centimeters across. And the question is, what are your thoughts on that? Is there anything you'd like to add, Romain, and others to what you said before? Romain, yes? Sure, yeah, I, I, I can. Um, well, to the best of my knowledge on those technologies, they're far further down the road in, in readiness compared to the ability to grab big objects. 
Um, and and the, here I, I see the legal question a lot more prominent because that means you're going to shoot lasers at objects you don't know to whom they belong because those objects are too small to be, uh, I mean, first you have a first issue is that if you want to use your laser to do that, you need to track those objects, which is, as, as Shrey has mentioned, a, a challenge and is not yet really done for, for lethal non-trackable objects that are, uh, let's say, five centimeter objects. And so you, you have a real technical challenge for doing that. And also then you have a, a legal challenge. It's who's going to give you the authorization to do that? And in general, I think there's a reluctance to have lasers in space uh, um, shooting other objects mm -hmm. down Definitely. for good reasons. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not, I, I think NASA's work on that is really good in, in, in trying to advance the discussion about cost and benefits of the different options. And and it does a good job uh, this way, but I think it also needs to be refined a bit uh, on, on the assumption and talk also about the legal and political costs uh, mm -hmm. associated with the different approaches. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And because we need to close now, I would like just to uh, point your attention to another question, which is about space situational awareness. Um, uh, would it be effective without an effective global regulation? which, um, as the person says, is, uh, is difficult to come between nation states. What's the way out? So um, would it be effective without an effective global regulation? Yes or no? Quick answer. Um, um, I think, sorry, can I, uh, I think from my point of view, I think uh, uh, there is already, uh, you know, global regulation. I think the Outer Space Treaty with its em emphasis on uh, state responsibility for space activities, the Liability Convention, I think read together, there's enough foundation to say that there is regulation. I think it's about the mechanics of how do we really convert those international obligations into domestic law. Mm -hmm. And I think each country has to probably make that effort to, to define it. Uh, today, the debate is not necessarily about is that legal consequences for debris associated damage. I think the, the real debate today is, uh, is the risk palatable enough for us not to regulate? And that's why I think you see some countries come back and say uncontrolled re-entry is permissible because they feel that the risk is so minor, it is palatable and we might as well incentivize uh, you know, deorbiting de through this channel as opposed to imposing a higher cost and effort around it. So I think there is global regulation and I think there is global intent. I think just the mechanics of how that must be converted into those uh, you know, little obligations in a licensing of the space activity, I think that's where the debate really lies. And I think that's where some harmonization is good. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is very clear and this complements very well what uh, Shreya has told us about the SSA before. So with that, I would like to thank everyone uh, of you um, and also the, the, the audience for participating and attending this, uh, this uh, webinar uh, on space safety and sustainability and active debris remediation and mitigation. Um, thank you so much for everyone, to everyone.